We're so pleased to host this first seminar for the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative to kick off the new year. It's great to have people in the room. I'm Liza Wilson Durant. I'm Associate Provost for Strategic Initiatives and Community Engagement at George Mason University and also the Director of the Northern Virginia Node of the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative. I'm so pleased to welcome now the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, Luis De Silva, who will welcome you all and tell you a little bit about what's going to happen next. Thanks, Luis, for being here. Thank you very much, Liza. Good morning, everyone who's joining us from the, the ether. Um, and for those of you in the room here, I'm Luis Da Silva. I'm the director of CCI. Uh, and this is our first seminar in the fall 2021 seminar series. So we're going to have a series of four seminars, um, all around themes that are of relevance to cybersecurity. Uh, in, in today's case, um, to non-terrestrial networks. So I'm really <clears throat> pleased to welcome Dr. Nishit Tripathi. Um, Nishit got his PhD from Virginia Tech um, a while ago in 97, uh, and he's been uh, very active in industry since then. Um, he has been representing Samsung until recently uh, to the 3GPP on several efforts, including non-terrestrial networks. So I won't um, take too long. I'll let uh, Nishit tell you more about his own background, but um, welcome. I'm very pleased to have you here with us today. And uh, thank you. to your talk. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm pleased to present here the topics related to non-terrestrial networks. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I hope you enjoy the next few minutes on NTN. Now, uh, some acknowledgements here. And can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay, so the work here uh, is sponsored by Samsung Research America because I represented Samsung uh, for about two years in 3 gpp So uh, the information is related to my personal research work. Uh, however, nothing is proprietary. It is all part of 3 gpp So everything is published in 3 gpp okay. And we'll try to make this uh, presentation available to you as well through a PDF file at least. Okay, and the certain diagrams uh, in this presentation, they are from the book that Dr. Reed and I have co-authored on 5G. A uh, little bit about myself in about a couple of minutes. Uh, in general, uh, my research interests include uh, 6G design and applying the 6G and 5G to various uh, applications. Uh, I'm Fortunate to have co authored the world's first multimedia book on 5G with Dr. Rick. Uh, we have done a lot of work together. Another piece of work uh, is uh, a textbook on cellular communications. The areas I have worked on uh, 5G, 4G, 3G, and so on. Uh, I applied AI to the handover or handoff in cellular systems, uh, one of the pioneering works in applying AI. I have contributed uh, usually with Dr. Rick to various organizations, including the Federal Communications Commission, uh, to guide the policy matters of the country. And of course, uh, I have been co-teaching the cellular class at Virginia Tech for more than a decade. In terms of uh, commercial uh, experience, I have about uh, 24 years uh, with uh, cellular networks, uh, starting from 3G all the way up to 5G. And uh, I have been fortunate to be involved in various aspects. For example, designing the cellular system, where to put the base station, uh, what is the link budget, what is the cell radius, uh, how to plan certain parameter of uh, the radio network. So design, and then uh, when we launch a new feature, right, we have to make sure it is working well. So we have to do some testing. So I have worked on uh, testing of uh, new features, new capabilities uh, for, the commercial networks for 3G and 4G. And I have also been involved with operations and optimization. So for example, how are commercial networks working? So we work with the real world logs uh, from the operators, major US operators. And uh, we have to figure out uh, if there are any opportunities to enhance. So I have contributed to that optimization as well. Uh, in terms of specific uh, design that I have done, uh, I work for Nortel and Huawei, and we have, uh, as part of that, uh, designed several algorithms. So, for example, coordination control algorithms, scheduling, and so on. 
So if you had access the internet in late 90s, early 2000s, then your uh, call would have passed through my algorithm. <laughs> and now, um, before we launch the system, we need to make sure that certain product features are working well. Right? So we have to figure out uh, uh, how to test the system for a certain feature. So we do some simulations. So I predicted 30% capacity gain for a new feature of load balancing. So do you want to guess how much they observed in real world? 13%. <laughs> so it made me happy. It was one of my early work. So basically, if you design your uh, simulators and the prototypes uh, in a certain way, then you can indeed get very close to what you see in the real world. Uh, at Huawei, I, I expanded from uh, 1X to more technologies, 1X video and uh, 3G UMTS. Uh, then uh, at our solutions, uh, I was able to expand uh, my knowledge further and contribute further. So there I got uh, knowledge uh, about uh, not only the radio network, but the core network, the services network. And uh, I helped uh, various engineers with the troubleshooting and uh, the operations of their real networks. So uh, I trained basically thousands of engineers oh. along the way. And uh, last couple of years, uh, uh, I was uh, representing Samsung in 3GPP. So the work uh, that uh, you see today is based on uh, my work uh, at Samsung on non-terrestrial networks. I have uh, helped my colleagues uh, with uh, making their research more practical because some of them do not have the experience with the real world. So they have done a lot of re research, uh, which is theoretical. But uh, when you want to apply that to the product, right? you have to make sure that what is possible, what is not possible. So I help them and I hope to continue to help uh, as part of my collaboration with CCM. Okay, so what do we plan for today, the next few years? Uh, what is a non-terrestrial network? Right? What did we go for NTN? And most of the time we'll be invested in discussing the challenges of the non-terrestrial network and how do we address those challenges. Now the example solutions that I'm presenting, they're based on my personal work. And I will tell you where the current status is in the standard about those solutions. Uh, we know that uh, here at CCI, we place a lot of emphasis on security. So I will briefly summarize uh, what kind of security mechanisms are available in NTA. Whatever we are doing today in the 3GPP standard is part of so-called release 17. That is the current release of 3GPP, third generation partnership product. So where do we go beyond that? Release 18, 19, and so on. So I will give you a little brief overview of upcoming enhancements. And then finally, uh, from a 6G perspective, what I think would be some of the important uh, trends. Uh, now we may not be able to go through all the slides, but I'll make them available. I thought we had one app, but we have about 30 for them. Okay, but uh, please uh, uh, make a note of your questions and I'll be very happy to answer questions. And no limit on the number of questions. So even after we end the webinar, uh, feel free to stay and ask questions. My email address uh, is on the first uh, slide, okay? And you will get the soft copy. So you can contact me through email as well. Okay, so let's get started with uh, why we should go for NTN and what is this NTN? So a non-terrestrial network is basically a network that is communication equipment very high. So here, as we mentioned, more than tens of kilometers from the Earth's surface. So please note, it is not for the drones. The drones or UAVs, right, they are not considered engine. So this is, uh, for example, for satellites. Okay, so it is very high in the, uh, above the sky, right? So that, that's the idea. Now, what kind of platforms are we talking about? So all kinds of uh, satellites, uh, geo, mu, leo, geo, uh, medium earth orbit, uh, low earth orbit, and also high altitude platform station hex. So there are some kind of planes. So they go to the stratosphere and they remain stationary. So they do not move. Okay. 
So we have those kinds of things helps. So that are also, those are also part of the NG. Now we cannot solve all the problem at the same time. So what standardization bodies do is they define the scope. So the scope of current ongoing work in release 17 is this. We have transparent field. So it means that our base station that is doing the baseband processing and the radio processing, that is on the ground. And the radio signals would go from GNB, that is the next generation node B, that is 5G base station, GNB to the platform, like a satellite, satellite to the user equipment, our device. Okay. So all the intelligence, baseband processing, all the RF is done GNB. So think of the satellite as a simple repeater. So it gets the signal from 5G base station, right? And it will amplify the signal, change the frequency, send it to the device. Okay, so it is that kind of repeater. So that is the current scope. In future, meaning release 18 and beyond, 3GPP is considering adding another kind of payload, regenerative payload, and I will talk about that a little bit. Okay, so that is the scope of release 17, ongoing work. Now, why NT? Why are we going for this satellite type of uh, situation? Well, NTN offers advantages, uh, the three main ones that we have mentioned, uh, ubiquity anyway. So as you know, uh, we have this digital divide, right? So our rural areas still do not have high-speed internet access. So now with the satellite, we are able to get there. Because uh, if you are at and or Verizon or T-Mobile, right? You want to make money after you deploy the network. But in rural areas, right, we have spread out, out communities. So there is not enough density, right? So it is expensive to support cellular systems in rural areas. But if your satellite, one satellite can cover thousand kilometer cell radio. Okay, so that's why this is an important aspect. Also, airborne communication and maritime that we have ships right in the oceans. So that will benefit from this NTA. Uh, scalability. So let's say we are watching a game, right? Uh, basketball game, baseball game. The same information would have to be transmitted to 100 users in that cell if 100 users are watching the game at the same time. Okay. So I am using one dedicated radio resource for one user, another dedicated radio resource for another. That's called unicast. But it is not efficient. So this broadcast multicast means that the base station will send a packet only one time. So using one dedicated resource for that service. So all the users, hundreds of them, could get the service at the same time. So very, very efficient. So satellite can do that. We can send a packet, a game, a movie, and hundreds and thousands of users can obtain that service at the same time. Very, very efficient. So scalability is another aspect. And uh, you are able to continue the service. Right? So for example, let's say you are going on a cruise. Right now, because of the virus, <laughs> you may not want to go. But uh, let's say the situation becomes normal after some time, and you go on a cruise. Now, you are in the middle of the ocean. Right? You are leaving the harbor. So how can you stay connected right, with your families, with your friends? So we can do the mobility management. We can do the handover so that it doesn't matter where you are. Right? You are on the land. You have nice coverage in the cities and so on, you go on a cruise, you still have excellent excellent uh, service. So that is the service content. So in summary, these are the things where the NTN brings unique value, right? Terrestrial networks cannot do it. So we expect this NTN to be an integral part in 6G as well. Okay, so where do we stand today? So basically what happened, uh, release 15 is the first release where 5G was introduced, 5G phase one, release 16, 5G phase two. And now we are currently in release 17 from 3GPP perspective. So NTN is a formal feature 
being introduced in release 17. It will be completed by, let's say, middle of the next year, uh, June 2022. Uh, because of the virus, it got delayed by six to nine months. Okay. We have to define the scope for release 17. So I mentioned a transparent payload is what we are assuming, GNB is on the ground. Also, we are assuming that the phones, the user equipment, they are GNSS capable, uh, global navigational satellite system. So it means that it has this GPS capability. Okay. And the reason for that is it will simplify some timing and frequency synchronization issue. Okay, because uh, we have UE here on the ground. And the satellite could be thousands of kilometers away right, in the sky. So there is a long propagation delay. So we have to make sure that the timing is synchronized very well. So the GNSS capable device, it is much simple. That's what we did. That. Eventually, in future, it will take, but that's what we have right now. So let's look at the main challenges and then the solutions. What are the main challenges? So we have a long and time varying propagation delays. So imagine a LEO satellite going from one side of the horizon to the other side, right? Let's say east to west, north to south, right? So then the distance between the device and that satellite keeps changing as a function of time. So it could be as little as maybe uh, five milliseconds, or it could be as high as 15 milliseconds. Right? So we have to keep doing this time synchronization as the satellite moves right, from one side to the other side. So that's very important. And if you have geo, geo is about 35,000 kilometers away from Earth, 35,000 kilometers. So it has delays of hundreds of milliseconds. That's about 200. So if you count uh, this transparent payload, right, going from set the UE to the satellite, satellite to the GND, and then coming back, you are looking at almost half a second. Right? So depending on the type of the satellite, you will have different kinds of delay, long delay or even time when delay. Large Doppler shift. So that means the frequency at which the device gets the signal, the receive frequency changes. So if uh, somebody is moving at a high speed, let's say you are driving on a highway, right? the signal that you are receiving would change right? compared to the transmitted frequency. So there's the Doppler shift. But on terrestrial systems, it is not a big problem. Okay, it is uh, maybe a few hertz and you are done. But this satellite could be moving at seven kilometers every second. Right, so it's very high Doppler frequency. So we have to do something to take care of that. Not only that, we have different kinds of beams. Uh, one beam is uh, earth fixed. So imagine a geo satellite. So that satellite is covering a given geographic area that is constant. It does not change. Time T1, it is covering here Arlington area. After 10 seconds, one hour, it is still covering the same Arlington area. Okay, so it is fixed beam. But there is another kind of beam, quasi earth fixed. Now, that is my contribution to the standard. I coined that term because in the standard, they were using uh, Leo fixed beam. Right? So, but in future, we will have geo fixed beam and Leo fixed beam. So, how do you separate them? So, I suggested uh, quasi earth fixed beam. So, it means that it is not 100% fixed all the time but it is fixed for a certain time period. So for one time window, the satellite would cover Arlington area. Let's say for uh, uh, 20 seconds, it will cover Arlington area. And in the next 20 milliseconds, it will cover maybe Maryland or West Virginia, right? So it changes, but during a certain period, it is fixed. So for a few seconds, it will be fixed. So it is quasi earth fixed. So we have those kinds of views. And Yet another kind of beam, earth moving beam. So here, the satellite beam 
continuously t1 to t2 to t3 it keeps changing okay that's another kind of so when we design the system in 3 gb we have to support all kinds of things. there are different challenges associated with all these different things so we have to take care of that cells could be very large maybe 1200 km diameter okay so it's pretty big which means that there could be many many users in this large area so available resources per user will be less in cellular networks we have couple of kilometer typically in the suburban and urban area right so we have lot of resources available per user but now expand that to large cells so now per user resources are very few so we have to be efficient in the way we allocate resources because we have too many users so we have to be careful and uh, the cells are moving uh, today our cellular networks uh, have specific identity so let's say louis is base station one so he has one identity uh, dr reed is another base station so he is controlling the cells with different identity and they do not change okay so as long as louis is in survey he will keep using the same identity all the time but that is not the case in non terrestrial networks because if i am the user now the cells would keep changing right so how do we make sure that you are connecting to the correct base station and you have also some identities that core network manages okay some so called tracking area and we'll get to that as part of the research area discussion so now that keeps changing so it creates a lot of other challenges that we will see so identity is another challenge signal strength we will see as part of a uh, research area discussion the in the terrestrial network you go from center of the cell to the edge of the cell there is a significant difference in the signal strength but not in a non terrestrial network we don't have that much large difference that's the way it is so we have to make sure that our hand of cell selection reselection algorithm can work reliably in the engine and beams we do not have circular beams so when the satellite covers a given area it is not a circle it is an ellipse so when you design the algorithms you need to make sure that you are not assuming a circular cell so that is one of the contributions that i made Uh, as part of uh, Samsung group, so those are the challenges. Uh, so in the next few minutes, we will talk about some solutions uh, related to the problems caused by this. Now there are some straightforward things we can do. Uh, so we can do pre-compensation, right? So if I know that uh, my frequency will change by a certain amount because of large adopter shift, I can do pre-compensation. So I can. A transmit at a different frequency so the receiver gets the signal at the right frequency so we have some simple things and some timers for example on the device i send a signal called a preamble a random access preamble so i send that preamble to the base station then i expect the base station to send me the response within a time limit now that window in the terrestrial network is only few milliseconds so the problem is if you have that short window we know that ntn could have tens or hundreds of milliseconds of delay so if you don't make any changes the device would think that is a problem so it will retransmit the preamble again it will retransmit the preamble because the window is short so one small thing we can do is we can extend that window to a longer value to reflect the propagation delay so those are some simple things we have done so extension of timer and so on. but let's talk about some more interesting uh, problems and solutions okay so as part of my work at samson i contributed about 35 ideas to 3gpp and uh, those are at various uh, stages under discussion and uh, in the next uh, couple of meetings they will identify and finalize the solution so let's see uh, what research solutions i had prepared okay. Remember, I said that uh, signal strength characteristics are different. 
between a terrestrial network and a non-terrestrial network. Let's see how. Here, oh, we have uh, the GNB, uh, that is the terrestrial network base station. Okay, so we are at the center here, center of the cell. So we have pretty good signal strength. Right? But if you go, let's say, away from the cell, so we are at the cell head, you see how signal strength is very deep, right? So there is a significant difference between the signal strength at the center, signal strength at the center. But compared with the NTN scenario, signal strength at the center and near the cell is very similar. Right? So they do not go down that rapidly. Okay. So that's the problem. Because we cannot just rely on signal strength to make a decision about cell selection and or. We have to do something more. So traditionally, what we would have done is if the neighbor cell signal strength, formally reference signal received power, RSRP, but let's say signal strength, if neighbor signal strength is greater than the serving signal strength by some amount delta, then it is a good time to do handover. Okay? But if you do that only for NTN, it would not work because uh, you see the signal strength variations are not much. And if you consider shadow fading and all that, it will make things more complicated. Okay. Uh, another challenge is that these cells are not circular. The beams are elliptical. So if you try to use a circle as the cell shape, right, and you try to make use of the distance as another criterion along with signal strength, then the UE, if you look here, uh, the UE is closer to cell two if you just look at the distance, but it is actually in cell number one, right? Because of this elliptical shape, if you just try to calculate the distance, you would think, hey, you should connect to cell two, right? Because it's the closest, but it is not right. right? We have to consider the elliptical shape so that we know whether we are inside cell one or inside cell two. So we need to be careful about that. So in summary, let's use this knowledge to see how we can make this kind of situation better. Okay, so here is the solution that we had proposed. And uh, again, we have some uh, references that are mentioned. So this specific one is from these contributions that uh, I had submitted. Uh, so here's the criteria, okay, that will make the handover more reliable. So if the UE is outside the inner area, so uh, we have defined this inner area as elliptical inner area. So if the U is outside that, right, so it is somewhere in the traditional handover region, and if the neighbor is able to provide a good enough quality, then we do the handover. So this is called the combination trigger. So in uh, 3GPP, we propose this combination trigger rather than only RSRP based. RSRP based would not work, right, because of the signal strength character. So here we are trying to combine signal strength and the location. The UE location, now we are representing in terms of the elliptical area, okay, whether we are inside that area or outside. So this will make the handover cell reselection much more reliable compared to what we uh, have if we use only the signal strength based strategy. There are other uh, also operations like uh, random access resource selection uh, that can make use of it. But we can make use of this concept uh, for neighbor cell search so that you know, should I look for a neighbor or not? Imagine you are a UE. Now, if you are right in this area, right, then generally speaking, you do not need to look for other neighbors, okay, unless uh, we have that quasi earth fixed beam um, where one satellite is covering an area, Arlington area, and after some time, another satellite is coming to cover the same area because that satellite will go away, the old one will go away. So, in that case, even if you are in the middle of the cell, you want to look for the incoming name. Okay. But if the satellite cells keep on moving, keep on moving, then 
if you are in the center, you do not need to search for neighbor. So this will save you a lot of battery power. Okay, otherwise uh, you will keep searching for neighbors even when there is no need. So this can significantly save the UV battery power. So in summary, if you're in the middle of this uh, cell, if you're in the yellow area, no need to search for neighbor for earth moving cells. So that is another way we can use this idea. Okay. Now we have very large cells. And if it is Leo, the cells will keep moving. So what are the implications of that on handover? Handover means we are moving the UV from one cell to another cell. That is handover. Massive handover. Because now we have thousands and tens of thousands of devices. We need to move from one cell to another cell, right? In a short period of time. So it will cause tsunami of signal. By the way, uh, in 3GPP, there is tsunami and earthquake warning system. So if there is tsunami coming, you will get a message on the device and you run as fast as you can. <laughs> so that tsunami is already part of the 3GPP. So we will get the tsunami of signal because I have to get the measurement report. If I'm the base station, I get measurement report from user one, from user two, user three, right? So thousands of users are sending me the message. Then the base station makes the handover decision. And then base station has to send handover command. So I send handover command to user one, handover command to user two. Those are done through dedicated signal. So it means I cannot send messages to all of those thousands of users quickly, right? Because I have limited resources. So there'll be long interruption in handover. Sometimes the calls might have to drop. So that is the problem. Uh, another problem is that our radio resources may not be utilized well. So there is a feature called conditional handover, CHO, conditional handover. So that tries to reduce the handover rate. So let me summarize how that works. But before that, let's create the foundation. How does the traditional handover work? I'm the UV. Louis is the best. So I make measurements of the neighboring cell. I send the measurement report to Louis, the base station. Then the base station will execute handover algorithm, talk to the target. Maybe Dr. Reed is the target base station. So Dr. Reed has enough resources to support the incoming UV. So Dr. Reed says, okay, I'm willing to support this UV. So Louis will send me a handover command message to me. So now I got a message from Luis that I can go to the new base station, Dr. Rick. So then I carry out random access with the new base station, Dr. Rick. And then I will send a handover completion message. So all the messages that you heard about measurement report, handover command, handover completion, they are all dedicated signaling messages, meaning we must use dedicated radio resources to send all these messages. So that is the problem. How do we solve the problem? Let's see. Okay. First of all, we want to send, if possible, maybe one message so that many, many UEs can learn that information. So that is called group cast. So we propose to 3GPP that we support group cast message, meaning that I have one group of neighbors. So if a lot of devices are going to uh, base station number one, then they get the configuration from base station one. Everybody gets at the same time. If some devices are going to base station number two, that is the target, then we have another group cast message that will convey the information. So now we are not sending individual dedicated message. It's a group message. So significant reduction in the radio resource utilization. Second, conditional handover that is enhancement to the traditional, what does it do? So in the conditional handover, today, we reserve radio resources in multiple targets. We do not know where the user will go, okay? So uh, 
our current serving base station will tell the device that uh, I am giving you resources in base station one and two and three. So you can go to any of those. Right? You do not need to send me any handover uh, report. You can directly go to that target because wherever you go, you have resources available in that set. So now I do not tell my serving base station that I'm going to target one or target two. I just go to the target and carry out communication. But what is the problem now in NTN? We have thousands of devices doing this handover, right? So you have to reserve resources for those thousands of views in many, many targets. That's waste of resources. Right? Then most of the resources will be consumed by all these signals. So what we propose is this. The device, before jumping to the target, it will provide identity of the handover candidate to the source base station. And then the source base station will talk to all the potential targets and cancel the resource reservation. So now they will release the resources for this U because the U is going to one specific target. So that will significantly reduce the overhead resource. Okay. So as soon as we know the U is going to target one, the U will tell the source base station, I'm going to target one. So we release the resource. Okay, so this is a significant improvement in the saving of radio resources. Otherwise, most of the resources will be consumed by all this signal. So when do we really do the user traffic transfer? Okay. So this is very, very uh, important uh, feature. Yet another idea. Remember we said that uh, when we do the handover completion, you have to tell the target, here is the completion message. But even that message records dedicated resources to it. So what we are proposing is this, that we use some kind of CDNA type technique. So one user will use, let's say code number one to send this acknowledgement. Another user can use the same time frequency resources and send another code. Okay, so we can multiplex lots of users using the same time frequency resource. Right? Um, that concept has been used for some other channels. Okay, there is some control channel in LP and 5G. So we extended that concept to this idea. Uh, and 3GBP is also discussing how to make uh, so-called layer one, layer two mobility. Here we are going to the lower layer, physical layer. When we say normal signaling, that is called layer three signal. Uh, but now we are replacing that by very fast signal that can be very efficient. So I hope you got the overall enhancement uh, related to him. Uh, I will give you one more example of how to improve the uplink schedule, whether it is LTE or 5G. The way uplink data transfer occur is through this traditional two-step approach. So if you are a UI, right? Uh, let's say you want to send a picture to your friend, Right, so you have to get the resources from the base station. You cannot just start sending any traffic. So when new packet arrive, uh, as a UA, you have to send a scheduling request to the base station. The base station will give you a little bit of grant, okay, only little bit, not a lot of resources, only little bit. And using that little bit of grant, the user equipment sends buffer status report. This tells the base station how much data we have. So if some UE has 10 megabytes of data, then the base station will give lots of radio resources. If somebody has a few bytes here and there, we will get very few resources, right? So that's the importance of this buffer status report. So now let's say we got some resources to carry some data in the uplink, then we send the data. This is how LT works, this is how 5G works. So if there is a two round trip data, see, the signal goes from UE to the GMB, GMB to the UE, right? There's one round trip, and then buffer status report to another round, another round trip. So there is a minimum of two round trip data, that's it. Now, for the terrestrial network, no problem, because things occur very, very quickly. Remember, NPN channel, tens of milliseconds, 
sometimes hundreds of milliseconds of delay. So it becomes very long. So what we proposed to 3D GP was compression. So we sent combined scheduling request and simplified buffer status report here. So we modified the uplink channel signal, physical uplink control channel. We modified that. So the base station knows how much data we have and quickly whatever grant we get, we can send the data. So instead of two times round trip, now we reduce that by half. So 50% improvement in the scheduling delivery. So that's another solution that we worked on. Okay, uh, now oh, in the interest of time, we'll skip some, uh, but I will briefly summarize that uh, in the core network, there is a procedure of uh, tracking area update. So basically, uh, if the UE goes from one big area to another area, right, uh, that's the paging area. So then uh, we have to inform the core network. So that is called tracking area update. Uh, but because of the cell identities that keep changing, uh, there, there are a lot of signaling problems. So we proposed a solution to that as well. Okay, let me spend uh, uh, a few uh, three to five minutes on security. Okay, so here is the good news. For the NTN, we do not need to make additional security change. So whatever 5G has defined for the terrestrial network, we will reuse those in the NG. So that's the good news. Now, 5G has made significant improvement in security compared to LTE. So here we have highlighted some key ideas. For example, uh, uh, in LTE, somebody could catch our IMG, International Mobile Subscriber ID, okay, because it is sent in clear text. But in 5G, we have introduced a new identity, subscription concealed identifier. So that uh, is like a proxy. It's not the real ID. Uh, in the core network, we map that the pseudo ID to the real image. Okay. So that provides additional security. Uh, we have the security for control plane and user plane. And uh, that is also better compared to what we have uh, in LTE. Uh, more specifically, uh, for the user plane. User plane means the logical plane that helps the user traffic, like email, web page, that is a user plane. So in LTE, there was no integrity protection. Uh, meaning, if somebody gets our email package, they can modify it, and the receiver would not that it has been modified. But now in 5G, we have added the integrity protection for the user plane. So that is a new in 5G. So if somebody alters our information, then we will know, oh, we should not trust that information. Okay, so that is the new feature that we have added. And then again, uh, very nice the unified access control. So somebody could access the network using 3GPP, technology like LTE and so on, or non 3 gpp such as Wi-Fi. So single authentication framework is used. Another very nice uh, feature is security within the network. In LTE, we have dedicated uh, network elements. We have $1 million piece of equipment called MME, Mobility Management Entity very complex, it does lots and lots of things. But in 5G, we have created many small network functions. Okay, so one big MME, now we have several, more than a dozen small network functions. So it is called service-based architecture. It's service-based architecture. So we can use the virtualization and automation technologies to implement those network functions. Okay. Now, I may have one network function from one vendor, another network function from another vendor. How do I know that it is not a fake vendor? Somebody might try to create some problem for us. So we need some security. So fortunately, 3GPP has thought about that and they have defined the security for those service-based interfaces as well as there are some non-service-based interfaces. 
So one network function can authenticate another network function. Very good feature. So we have security within the network as well. Uh, uh, another thing I would like to highlight very quickly. The days of integrated base station are almost gone. Earlier we had this one GNB base station. It was doing all kinds of things. But now we broke GNB into two pieces. Right, the central unit and the uh, distributed unit, and then we are trying to uh, break it further, logically. Right? So now we have to have security between those as well, right? Between the central unit and the distributed unit. So basically, the good news is that we hope uh, that this will also continue six. Uh, okay, I will give you one example of where we are going beyond release seventeen. So this is a regenerative payload. So <laughs> Dr. Rick calls it flying GMB. So this is GMB. The entire base station is on the satellite. Remember earlier for transparent payload, the base station was on the ground, right? But now the base station is on the satellite. Okay, so that gives uh, several benefits. It reduces the delay and we can now serve the area in the middle of the ocean. Uh, because for transparent payload, we need to connect the base station to some gateway that is on the ground. But if you're in the middle of Pacific Ocean, there is no landmass to put your gateway, right? So how do you support that? So then this regenerative payload, I can have one regenerative payload, one satellite, another regenerative payload, another satellite, and they can talk to each other. So we can connect to some gateway on the ground, on the continent, right? So this regenerative payload will cover those uh, areas. So there are no coverage holes. So we really need this kind of feature. So it is being proposed for release eight. Uh, six C, let me spend a couple of minutes on that. And then I will let uh, 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 questions come in. Okay, so there are lots of new services uh, such as the digital twin or digital replica, high fidelity hologram. 5G wanted to do this, but it couldn't. The right now uh, we have no capacity for that yet. Energy harvesting, uh, charging the uh, device, for example, uh, sensing as a service, we can sense a lot of things, uh, including let's say temperature variation, pressure variation, etc. Uh, in terms of the performance, uh, we are hoping to get to some terabits per second, maybe one terabits per second. Uh, latency uh, on the air interface will go uh, maybe few hundred microseconds. Today it is uh, a millisecond, but we will go for the down. Instead of 10 years, uh, we hope to increase that uh, to beyond 10 years. But there are some high level concepts. Uh, for example, AI, now right from the beginning, we think that AI will be used in the yeah, radio network and the core network. Um, RF technologies, we are looking at supporting higher frequencies, so called terahertz and uh, network uh, topologies. So we will. Uh, use more and more of network slicing. We will use uh, multi-access edge computing and increased degree of orchestration and virtualization will be used. Uh, so those are sort of high, some of the high level concepts. So I would like to do research, uh, for example, how we can connect the device to multiple networks, so-called super connectivity. Today we have two technologies, we go beyond that. Uh, Reconfigurable open and intelligent network. And so that's another area that I would like to uh, do research on. We can have multiple radio protocol stack. So one stack from 4G, one 5G, one 6G, uh, one could be narrow band IoT and we use the appropriate protocol stack. Uh, this will be very important for how to represent the media. Because if we are thinking of hologram, we are thinking of these immersive video calls, right? But at the end of the day, if we have so much data, how to represent that compactly? So we can serve those uh, services for many, many users at the same time. This will become very, very important. So uh, how to use the spectrum? Because at the end of the day, it's wireless system. So we need to use every single hertz that we get from the government, right? So we can use that for access, front hall, mid hall, back hall, and maybe adaptive hall. So there could be configurable split in the protocol stack. So we can use that. Um, I would like 6 not to use the security as an afterthought, right? So instead of modifying the 5G, to make it a highly secure system. Let's make 6G secure right from the beginning. So I can have one flavor, then I can use for commercial operations. 
right? Where spectral efficiency is very important. I can use another flavor in 6G that is good for military communication. So we sacrifice uh, efficiency for security, right? So I, I hope that we can do that. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to present. I want to make sure that you have enough time for questions. So Louise, I'm ready if uh, we have some questions coming in. Thank you very much. We should uh, be moved maybe. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So maybe we can take some questions from the room. And in the meantime, I'll ask Susie uh, if there are any questions from uh, the remote audience. Okay. And if you have any questions, please do use the, the chat box um, or the Q&A box uh, so that you that we relate the questions to the speaker. But are there any questions from the room? Yes, there's one. Okay. Um, I was curious about your comments or your thoughts on the B form factor for NPN, specifically the cannon and battery power. This link budget and the yeah. delay. Very good. So the question here is uh, that what about the UE form factor? Would we be similar to what we have today or not? Excellent question. There are two kinds of devices right now that we are thinking of. One would be just like a smartphone, right? So regular smartphone, uh, same form factor. Okay, that's one uh, possibility that 3 gbp is supporting. And the second one is um, uh, with a small aperture antenna like dish. Right? So at our home, for example, in a rural area, right, we can put a dish that will talk to the base station. And then internally, we use uh, some other technology like Wi-Fi or something. So it will be that kind of terminal. Now that uh, dish kind of uh, device can also be placed on, let's say, trains. Right? So you can put that on the moving platform like train or ships, and that can talk to the satellite. So all the people, all the devices on the train can make use of connectivity, et cetera. So yeah, two kinds of devices are currently supported. Very good question. So let me give you a question from the remote audience. Okay, so, okay. So um, it has to do with your um, your point about the coverage being ellipse rather than circle. So, oh, okay. um, so the question is, the intersection of a cone with a sphere is a circle if aimed towards the center of the earth. So why are the cells elliptical? Okay. so. Uh, it has to do with what is the footprint on the surface, okay? So uh, imagine that there is a satellite, right? It is sending a signal out, right? So that satellite antenna has a certain characteristic, right? So when that signal reaches the earth surface, now we are covering a two-dimensional surface. So on that two-dimensional surface, um, the way the coverage is, it is elliptical in the shape. So it is that you can think of it projection of 3D onto a 2D surface because earth surface uh, is like 2D, right? It's like flat. That's okay. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll have another one from the audience, uh, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, given the dependency of NTN on um, GNSS, um, does that mean that spoofing of GNSS signals now becomes a security threat for NTN. Okay, so let me uh, clarify what I mean by the use of GNSS in the satellite system, in the NTN. You should, uh, let me just uh, relay the question. Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm not sure that the audience use your question. <coughs> oh, there's there's a, there's a microphone, okay, okay. hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so basically the question is whether this uh, GNSS, relies on GNSS, would create any problem or not. Okay. So currently in release 17, what 3GPP is assuming is that the device is capable of receiving GNSS signal and it will use that GNSS signal that it has received to adjust some timing and provide its location report to the network. Okay. So it is used by this device, right? Now, as you know, we have GPS receivers even in our phones, right? So yeah, somebody could mess up the GPS signal that can happen even today, but this is from the perspective of a single UE, okay? So just the uh, UE location is reported, okay? Lat long is reported to the network. So that will simplify a lot of stuff. Plus the timing synchronization will become better. But the network itself does not need to use GPS, although it would generally use for synchronization. Good. So there is no additional threat beyond what we have in terrestrial. 
so in a sense, you, you could spoof user equipment then if the user is dependent upon GNSS because you could screw up their timing. Now, uh, unless the GNSS signal itself is modified. Yeah, so somebody can modify the GNSS signal that it can mess up lots of things. That, that can happen today in terrestrial network and then it can happen in a day. So it's the same, the threat is the same. Yeah. Good, good question. So one more question from our remote audience. Uh, what are your thoughts on security enhancements needed to integrate uh, connectivity between non-terrestrial and terrestrial networks? So I have good news. <laughs> so the good news is that this PN versus LTN, those are access technologies. So I run the device. I can access my services through the terrestrial network base station or I can watch a movie through this the satellite, uh, non-terrestrial network. So the access is different, but as, you, as I showed you in the architecture, that base station is connected to core network, right? And it is the core network that is in charge of uh, making sure this is a valid user, so be a mutual authentication, et cetera. And then sort of unfortunately, because of lack of time, I could not go in through the, into details of security. But basically, the core network creates some kind of key. Okay, there is security anchor function. It creates some key that goes to some other entity called AMF in 5G access and mobility management function. It creates some kind of security key that goes to the base station. The base station creates another kind of key. Now, those keys are used for integrity protection and the ciphering of the control thing and the user plane. Okay, so the good news is that whatever security enhancements we do for terrestrial network, we can use those here. So that, that's the short uh, answer. Very good, good question. Take like another question from the remote audience. Um, are the inner and outer areas that you showed in uh -huh. your slides uh, a similar concept to um, mobility control for forward coverage, which used in LTE? Now, um, in uh, 3GPP right now, uh, there is some concept of so-called V2X zone, okay, for vehicle to anything communications. Uh, but this specific concept that we are proposing, it, it is the hierarchical architecture. Uh, and uh, this inner area is used for the non-terrestrial network because the kind of coverage we have is not certain. Okay, so it would be different from uh, what uh, we have in 3GPP right now. Yes. Yeah, good question. Question control. What is the three GPP okay or oh, I think because of uh, the mask, your voice has been attenuated. Um, what is the point of your opinion from three GPP about the use of uh, the satellite infrastructure from already existing satellite internet providers, such as Starlink and other companies, to enable those on terrestrial networks? Okay. Yeah. So the question is that can we use this uh, NTN kind of feature? for let's say uh, older previous releases 16 and earlier, right? No, if you would uh, if there were or existing things. service product. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately we cannot uh, just start using the existing service provider, okay? Uh, unless um, they are able to connect to this uh, gateway uh, on the ground and gateways connected to the base station. See, uh, I could not go into more details of the architecture, but here is the situation. Satellite needs to connect to a gateway on the ground and that NTN gateway connects to the base station. Now that link is called feeder link. So that feeder link between the satellite and the gateway is not defined by 3 d So it's a proprietary interface right now. Maybe in future it will become an open interface, but right now it is proprietary. So if, if the existing service provider, if they can upgrade the software, right, and do that kind of translation and support that feeder link, then they can make it work. But I'm not sure if they are yet capable of doing that because they have to support this proprietary interface. If they can support it, we are good because there is some control signaling that would need to go between the satellite platform and the NTN gate. Then they can do it. Very good question. Uh, any other uh, question <laughs> here or? Uh... 
Hmm. First, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'll go through yeah, your notes with First, uh, will the deployment cost will, will, will that be high? Anytime you <laughs> start something new, yes, definitely. Uh, it, it's a brand, it's an in, independent network, completely independent. So, yes, but there are several operators uh, in, interested in this. Iridial Intels that uh, Vodafone, they're interested, they're participating actively in 3 So yeah, they will have to invest in that, definitely. So related to that, what has changed? Because a couple of decades ago, there was a lot of interest in satellite uh, yeah. providing cellular service and so on. 5G, my friend. <laughs> 5G is not another generation of technology. It is a transformational technology. It is very efficient, right? very flexible. So you, I tell people, right, when I doctorate and I teach the class, 5G, if you want to remember one word about 5G, forget about everything else, flexibility. It is super flexible. The radio network is flexible, phone network is flexible, frequency bands, there are all kinds of hooks, capabilities available. So now we are able to tune or adapt the network to meet any kind of requirements. That's what has changed. Yeah, good, very good. Question there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually have two questions. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so um, one question is, how, so the simplified mechanisms of attaching and then handovers and uh, assign, allocating the resources sort of create an incentive for, let's say, uh, players uh, to, whether that's UEs or whether that's operators, to actually use those mechanisms because they can gain resources faster, maybe uh, more reliably and so on. So how do you prevent from that, from uh, creating this um, disparity between the terrestrial users and non-terrestrial users, Nexus. And then the second one is, um, how do you use those group cast mechanisms um, um, fairly among the services and different service providers? Because obviously I assume that uh, not every service provider would have their own satellite to, to Okay, good, Sorry. so there are two questions. So we'll take care of one by one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's say the first question that uh, we have some users connected to terrestrial, some connected to NTN. Right. So how do we prioritize? So here is the situation. Just like LT and 5G, right, both. The control of resources resides with the base station. I call it commander in chief. So UE can request anything it wants, but the GNB will make use of the reports it has received from all these UEs, the service promises we have made. We have made some quality of service promises to different users for the existing services. So for example, 5G, something called 5QI. 5G, quality of service indicator. LT, we have QCI, quality of service class indicator. So we have promised the users certain class of quality of service. And the base station looks at the available resources and what all the users are currently requesting. And it will uh, run this uh, super intelligent scheduling algorithm to allocate resources. So, the GNB is the one that makes the final decision. You can make a request, right? And the base station will use that as one of the inputs. Now, uh, earlier, the, uh, for example, in Manaxi video, some users uh, uh, were cheating. Some device vendors were cheating because at that time, Qualcomm had put a lot of control in the device. So if the device says, I want one megabit per second, the base station has to give that user one megabit per second if it wanted to solve that. But now in LT and 5G, the control is with the base station. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, and in terms of group cast, you asked the second question, that how do you do this group cast? Because we have one operator, we have another operator. So whatever I have talked about is for a given operator. So if I'm a satellite operator, then I have purchased some radio equipment, some core equipment. So I am doing group cast for my own network. I'm not doing anything uh, for users of another operator, okay? Except for the roaming part, we, we will have roaming agreement. But other than that, the resources, the network functions that the operator controls, they're all effectively owned by that operator. So we are not doing group cast across operators. The group cast is within a given operator. Oh, very good question, thank you. Okay, um, we're out of time. So we'll <laughs> cut things off here. Um, I want to thank uh, the speaker. I want to thank all of you who joined us here and, and remotely as well. Maybe we can um, give you some some uh, round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, stay tuned for the next uh, seminar in the CCI seminar series for the fall, uh, which is going to be in September. So thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you.